Welcome to the Plant Trainers Podcast, where we're helping people improve their quality of life through nutrition and fitness. And now, your hosts, nutrition and wellness coaches, international speakers, Adam and Shoshana Chaim. Hey, I'm Adam Chaim. And I'm Shoshana Chaim, and we are Propelled, Propelled by, by Plants. Plants. Today, we bring to you episode 480, Cancer Lifestyle Practices with Dr. Dominic Brandy, MD. In this episode of the Plant Trainers Podcast, we talk with Dr. Dominic Brandy about the best lifestyle practices for people with cancer. Dr. Brandy opens up on all of his personal battles with multiple myeloma, shedding light on his experiences and insight and research findings. Together, we explore the crucial role of sleep and melatonin in the context of cancer management, the importance of fasting, the significant impact of incorporating nuts into a cancer-fighting diet as well. We also delve into the complex world of conventional virus, alternative cancer treatments, the potential advantages of antioxidant supplementation, and the realm of herbs. Really, we talk about a lot in this episode. So prepare for an illuminating conversation that may revolutionize your perspective on cancer and overall health. Dr. Brandy is a practicing medical doctor for 44 years running and is a plastic surgeon and has an anti-aging practice during that time. He's published 76 scientific peer-reviewed articles and nine textbook chapters in the medical literature, written many consumer articles, and given over 200 lectures at international medical meetings. Five and a half years ago, he was diagnosed with a blood cancer called multiple myeloma. Natural Insights into Cancer is Dr. Brandy's ongoing project to share what he has learned through scouring the medical literature about what can be done naturally to fight this dreaded disease. Dr. Brandy is the author of the best-selling book, Beat Back Cancer Naturally. This book includes five scientifically proven natural and plant-based ways to prevent, survive, and thrive with cancer. Get ready for a truly eye-opening discussion that could completely reshape your views on cancer and your overall well-being. Enjoy the show. Hey everyone, now it's more important than ever to stay close and connected to us as we're going to be making some changes here at Plant Trainers. So please head over to planttrainers.com and get our plant-based comfort foods recipe book for free. That's a $14.99 value just by signing up for our newsletter so that you can know what changes are because we want to make sure that we stay in touch. And now for a moment of gratitude. I'm grateful for the connections that I have been making with people this fall. The weather is great and it's fun to be out and talking to people. You mentioned the weather and I'm grateful for the fresh crisp air this fall and the beautiful colors on the trees. Dr. Brandy, thank you so much for joining us on the Plant Trainers podcast today. Hey, it's great being here. Looking forward to it. We would love to know if you have a moment of gratitude to share with us and our listeners before we begin. Yes, I'm gratitude. I have a lot of gratitude that right now I'm in a position where uh, I've been able to help so many cancer patients stay in remission and also just give them a better positive attitude. Uh, That's a big part of it. So that's been probably the greatest addition to my life that's really been amazing. I I love when it fills people's cup to help other people because that's in turn helping them as well, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. And I I have a 24-7 access uh, for my patients. So when I wake up in the morning, I have about 25 text messages. So so just being able to help them day in and day out, because a lot of them do struggle with the mental part of having cancer because it, it just, it's constantly on their minds. And I try to help them deal with that, like not think too far out in the future, try to do something fun every day. Um, So there's ways to deal with that. So I I think that's a big part of it and helping them get through their struggles. I feel like a positive attitude is such a huge component to, I guess, getting into remission, but not only that, but in everyday life, it's such a Uh, struggle for so many people and having a positive mindset, a positive attitude is such an important thing to have. And I was going to ask you how you get your your patients there and, and get them to wrap their head around all this and get into a positive set. But I feel like that's a whole other show, or at least it could be, but I don't know, maybe there, maybe there's one or two things you could share with us that help people just put themselves in a positive frame. Well, what I, what I tell them to do is not think too far out ahead, because if you do that, you're going to be thinking about your cancer, you know, what's going to happen to me. I know when I first got diagnosed, I got diagnosed with multiple myeloma six years ago. 
And I've been able to stay uh, in a remission for that amount of time, which most people with uh, myeloma, they relapse at about two years. But I've been able to do that through all the different precepts that I talk about. And I know when I first got diagnosed, I didn't sleep for a full month. I mean, because I was thinking about, am I going to have pain? Am I going to lose my hair? What, how am I going to die? What, am I, am I going to die in a year or two? And th th I wasn't able to sleep. And then I, I actually saw a uh, psychologist for three visits. One of my friends who had myeloma advised me to do that. And that really helped me a lot. She just really, she was a, a psychologist that specialized in cancer patients. And, and one of the things she told me uh, that I found interesting, she said 95% of cancer patients, when they get near the last three months of life, they are not depressed. They've kind of accepted it. They're happy. They just realize that, hey, this is the end. They try to make amends with their family, tell their family they love them. Now, she said there's 5% that go down kicking. But she said, you know, um, that the majority, 95% of them actually are are very happy they're not depressed. So that made me feel good. Also with pain management, she said, hey, when you get to that stage, uh, the cancer can always be put under control with morphine and or narcotics and so forth. So I always try to let the patients, I share a lot of that information with them, but I just, I just tell them, listen, wake up every day, try to be as healthy as you can, exercise every day, because that's probably one of the best things you can do for your mental attitude, you know, always every day I do something fun. I make it a point. I ride my bike or I'll watch a movie with my wife or we'll get in the sauna together. I try to do something fun every day. And I, I really advise them to do that. Like plan that out in your schedule every single day. Just make each day count. And I actually find that a lot of cancer patients, they have a better mental attitude. The cancer's almost been a blessing. You know, you say, what are you grateful for? Believe it or not, I'm actually grateful that I got myeloma because my life has been so much better since I had myeloma because I just savor every single day. You know, I appreciate everything. I look at the clouds. I just look at the marvel of creation every day. And I never did that before. I just woke up. I worked. I came home and just it was just a just a kind of a I was on a treadmill and it just I, I just really wasn't enjoying every single day. So I think that's the main thing with the cancer patients is just, and then giving them support because there are days they get blue and then they text me and I just try to like, you know, give them encouragement. And sometimes I'll just send them, uh, I have a place in Miami over the, over the winter and I'll just send them a picture of the sun coming up over the beach or something, you know, something is beautiful with a little kind of a cheery note. But I, I do think that's a big part of of helping cancer patients. And I know that part of how you help cancer patients is with nutrition. And I wanted, before we get into a little bit more of that, can you tell us how you found plant-based nutrition and what it's done for you? Was it this diagnosis that got you there or did something trigger you before to take a look at this? What's really interesting is that I actually started eating whole food plant-based two months before I got diagnosed. I, I was on a uh, Viking cruise and I've read well over 300 books uh, on uh, health and nutrition um, because I've always had an anti-aging practice in my in my medical uh, in my medical practice. And when I go on vacation, first thing I do is I go on Kindle and I look for a book and How Not to Die by Michael Greger popped up. And I'm thinking, okay, this book sounds kind of interesting. <laughs> so I started reading it and I'm two days into the the book and the science was just overwhelming. I mean, for your listeners, if you get the hardback, it's about two inches thick and about an inch of it are scientific references. And that was the thing that really intrigued me about the book. And it was just showing how when you look at, at cultures, uh, research cohort groups that eat more plant based, you know, they have much lower incidence of cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, really all cause mortality. So I'm two days into this cruise. And I tell my wife, I'm going to start eating whole food plant-based. She thought I was, she thought I was totally out of my mind, but I've been totally plant-based. It's a, that was September of 2017. And then November of 2017. And between that time, I started feeling some pain in my uh, right clavicle. And one day we were watching TV. I accidentally knocked over a container of water. I lunged for it. My bone just cracked right in half. And then they did all these tests and x-rays, MRIs, 
biopsies and they found out I had this IgA uh, kappa multiple myeloma, which is an incurable blood cancer. So that's when I started eating whole food plant-based and I've been doing it ever since. And then what happened then, I was diagnosed with an IgA uh, kappa multiple myeloma, which is the most aggressive. So my doctor wanted to put me on a triple regimen of two oral medications and a drug called Valcade, which is a proteasome inhibitor, which when I was doing reading, almost everybody gets a very severe peripheral neuropathy of their fingers and their in their feet. And because I am a plastic surgeon, I really didn't want to have any negative effects on my hands or my feet. So I rejected the Valcade. And my doctor was super upset with me. He didn't think I was going to get into remission with this IgA. But every month, I just kept getting better and better. And I was eating this whole food plant-based diet. And that's one of the reasons I rejected the Valcade also. I just felt that I was going to be able to do it with my diet the lifestyle changes that I was making. And by six months, I was in a totally complete remission. I've been in a remission ever since then. And my my medications are very low and were actually weaning me off. In fact, on July 26th, I went in there and he kind of shocked me. He said, you don't have myeloma. And he said, I promise you, you're not going to die of myeloma, which kind of like, I said, doctor, how could you tell me that? Um, he said, I just want to take you off meds. And I said, listen, at that point, I was taking it 16 days on with a, a 12 day rest. And I said, why don't we just continue to wean it? And if I get down to nothing, then I'll be your first cured patient of multiple myeloma. We'll see what happens. But what happened in that first six months, I did a deep dive into the scientific literature. So I wanted to know every herb, every tea, every type of lifestyle change that I could make that would enhance my chances of staying in a complete remission. And then when I got to about a year, I decided to give a, a talk at one of the local hotels. I invited people on my Facebook, uh, people that I knew you know, personally. I thought I was going to get maybe 50 people. 125 people showed up to this thing. And it was amazing. Uh, we, I had a standing ovation. I've never had a standing ovation for anything in my life. I don't know if they felt sorry for me or uh, because I had cancer or uh, they thought that maybe they thought the lecture was good. But I, I personally think it was because there were many cancer patients out there. And I think they felt that they were at the mercy of the chemo drugs, uh, the radiation, the surgery, and there wasn't anything they could do on their own. And in fact, there were several people that came up to me after the lecture. I remember this one lady had multiple myeloma and she was definitely obese. And she came up to me and she said, you know, doctor, I, I asked my oncologist if I should change my diet. And he said, no, just keep eating the way you're eating. You'll do fine. And she looked me in the eye. She said, she said, doctor, I just knew that couldn't be right. And I had several people like that. So at that point, I developed my website, Natural Insights into Cancer, Dot com, uh, my Instagram site, Cancer Veggie Doc. I would have meetings every month at one of my med spas. We used to get 100 people. I don't even know how we squished them in there. But I would have guest speakers coming in. Um, and we would start every meeting with a Michael Greger five-minute video. Because one of the things I've really stressed with these people is if you're going to stay on a plant-based diet, you need to be constantly educated. So I would actually have them put it on their phone and tell them every week, try to watch at least one of these videos, even preferably every day. Because if, if you're not constantly educated, it's really hard to stay on a whole food plant-based diet. I mean, you have to have recipe books. You really need a lot of support. And I do think doing that has helped a lot of those people stay on that uh, whole food plant-based diet. And then at that point, a lot of people were asking me, hey, you need to write a book. You have all this knowledge. So I started my book Memorial Day 2018. Uh, I finished it on Labor Day and I had it on Amazon like in November and then a book launch the week after that. So, so I moved on this very quickly because I really wanted to help a lot of people because I knew it was helping me. I had all this knowledge and I really wanted to share it with, with patients. So now I do really hundreds of virtual consultations for patients all over, really all over the world. I just did one from somebody from Japan the other day. And the constant 24-7 coaching really does kind of put the icing on the cake because it really helps me, you know, get them to the finish line.
Well, I think that's amazing. A, that you can do this with people everywhere. B, how fast you hit the road running to get this out there for people and start to make a change. And it's no, no one can dispute the fact that I, and I'm looking at the book over there, How Not to Die. So if you see my eyes going that way oh, yeah. on YouTube, you know why. <laughs> but, you know, no one could dispute the science. No one could dispute the evidence. And the things that happen when people go plant-based is incredible. You know, we watched Adam's tumor shrink. So I know that there are other parts of lifestyle and stress that really play into it as well. And I know that you are very passionate about sleep and people getting the right amount of sleep and how that can affect your cancer. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, one of the things that um, that I really strongly recommend my patients to do is get on melatonin for a couple reasons. First off, it, it does get you to sleep, but it does have very potent anti-cancer, antioxidant activity. Uh, in my book, I have a couple pages on melatonin. The studies are 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 definitely, they're, they're, they're prolific. I mean, they're all over the place. And you really need to, I try to get my patients up to 20 milligrams. But what I do, for instance, last night, I watched the Steeler game, which was like aggravating as hell. And I shouldn't have done that. Uh, before I went to bed, but I took the melatonin, I got to sleep, but I woke up around two o'clock. I took the melatonin again. And then I woke up at four o'clock. I took the melatonin again. And I have an, I don't know if you guys have an OA ring. But no, but we've looked into them a, before. An yeah. OA ring is something you should definitely look into. So when I looked at my OA ring this morning, what was interesting is that when I woke up and I took that melatonin, Right after that, I went into a deep sleep. And then when I woke up and then I took the melatonin, right after that, I went into a deep sleep. So I've been noticing that when I wake up and I take the melatonin in the middle of the night, um, I immediately get into a deep sleep. And, and melatonin has a half-life of about an hour. So it, it really gets out of your system pretty quickly. And one of the reasons that people don't sleep as well as they get older, they their melatonin levels basically just decline with age. So that's one of the things that I strongly recommend. And then there's things that you need to do. I think everybody knows you need to get to bed kind of at the same time. You know, don't eat alcohol before you go to bed. Try to not eat three hours before you go to bed. Um, you know, no caffeine. Exercise. You know, one thing I've noticed, if I exercise late, I really have my OA ring scores the next day aren't very good. So, and, and on the OA ring, they give you a... Like when you wake up in the morning, they'll give you an optimal score. They'll give you a um, good or fair or then pay attention score. And then they'll give you advice for, you know, what you did wrong that night and what other ways that you can improve your sleep. But but I, I really do think that the OA ring is something that I advise for a lot of my patients. It's not cheap. It runs about, I think, $2.99 to like $3.99. Depends on the color that you get. There's like gold, silver, pewter, black. Um, that you just wear and then you charge it maybe once a week and you just keep it on your, I just use it kind of as a wedding ring, but some people put it on their index finger. My wife uses it too. So every morning we wake up and we text each other our, our <laughs> over scores. But I do think sleep is extremely important and getting into that deep sleep is super important because that's when a lot of the tumor surveillance is going on. That's when DNA repair is going on. I'm sure you're familiar with autophagy when your body's like cleaning up a lot of the misfolded proteins and the debris. So a lot of that is going on through sleep. And then if you can extend your fasting uh, during sleep beyond that, I do think there's a lot of benefit. Like I personally eat in a 16-8 window. I don't know if you guys do that, but I usually eat my last food at about eight. Um, and then I don't eat really until noon. Uh, the next day. And the first food I eat are actually a variety of nuts uh, before I take my supplement. So I, um, I, and I, in fact, I just did a video before I did this. It was on uh, the synergy of, of foods, how when you, when you eat a variety of different foods, there's this crazy synergy among these phytochemicals uh, in their fight against cancer. So instead of taking a handful of walnuts, I actually do two walnuts, two almonds, two pecans, two Brazil nuts, a hazelnut, three pistachios. I'll do some sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds. So I do that before I take my supplements for two reasons. First off, the nuts themselves have some very powerful anti-cancer effects. I want to take advantage of the synergy. 
But also before you take supplements, you should always, always take fat or you won't absorb uh, the fat soluble nutrients, the phytonutrients and the vitamins, minerals and so forth. So there's a lot, there's a lot there and a lot of information. You're, you're so knowledgeable. I would just want to go back to the melatonin because I think that some of the listeners might be having some of the same questions that are going through my head now where we hear, and I'm talking about mainstream uh, information, we hear that melatonin is addictive, um, that you're not necessarily getting the right kind of sleep. I know that from experience taking melatonin, sometimes I can't, maybe I'm taking too much, but sometimes I can't get up in the morning and it doesn't leave, it doesn't seem to leave my, my body within an hour or two. So talk to us a little bit about, no, I don't want to say myths. I don't want to say misinformation, but some of the back and forth that's happening with melatonin. Okay. First off, everybody's a little bit different. Like if my wife takes a one milligram melatonin, she's like you, she's like drowsy, like the next day. I what I personally recommend is first off not taking it uh, orally, taking some legally. So all the ones I recommend are sublingual. So typically, I start patients on a three milligram uh, Nature's Bounty uh, sublingual. It's like a cherry flavor. Stick it under the tongue. See if you can handle that. If you can't, then I'll look for a one milligram sublingual. And and by the way, the, the way I get most of my supplements, I go on a I don't know if you're familiar with this website. It's called consumerlab.com. It's a great website. And they basically, you have to sign up for it. It's, it's inexpensive. But when I'm looking for a supplement, like the other day, I was looking for a good probiotic supplement from one of my patients. So I go on there and then they they basically analyze these things like, I mean, everything that's in them. Um, for instance, I was using an olive oil. I was using um, uh, Calipera. And I thought it was like a good extra virgin olive oil. And then I looked on Consumer Lab, 25% of it was rancid. Mm. So then I went through there and they always have a top pick. So their top pick was Lucini. And I think California uh, Olive Ranch was one of the top picks too, organic. And so I now I use uh, Lucini. But if you go on there, um, you can a lot of times you can find the best supplement because they'll always have like a top pick. Uh, when you go on Consumer Lab. So like I'll go on Consumer Lab or the patient can go on there and look for like melatonins and they may only be able to handle a point, like a one, a 1%. There's also a botanical melatonin that's like about 0.3 milligrams that uh, is on uh, Amazon. I think it's called Herba Melon or something like that. I, I could I could find out for your audience, but we're just going to take a little break here because I want to share with you that growth is something that happens for everyone and every business. And we've been going through a lot of personal and professional growth here at Plant Trainers, and we want to stay connected with you. That's why we're giving away our plant based comfort food ebook that's worth fourteen ninety nine for free at our website at planttrainers.com or by clicking the link in the show notes. Click on that. Get on our newsletter because we're going to be making. Some serious changes and you need to be aware of what's going on we look forward to connecting with you there and now back to the show but i i do think it is very helpful and you you'll, you'll be able to find the right dose uh you know maybe that botanical would be the right dose for you like the 0.3 milligrams but when i look at my oa ring and you talked about it doesn't give you deep sleep i know for a fact like like last night for example when i took it every time i took it i went into a deep sleep for almost like like a half an hour after I took it each time I took the melatonin. So it, it does definitely doesn't affect your deep sleep because I know for a fact when I look at the OA ring uh, that it's not doing that. And like I said, the half-life's about an hour. So what is probably happening once the once it gets down to about half of its dose, that's probably when I'm kicking out of the uh, the deep sleep and then going into maybe like a REM sleep or light sleep. I mean, typically an average night, I'm in deep sleep for about an hour and I'm in REM sleep for about an hour, typically. And so is there any negative effects or a negative? I I don't yeah. find any negative effects to melatonin, personally. Um, it's the most potent antioxidant that's released in your body, has very potent anti-cancer effects. Um, I think some of the negativity has been with kids eating these gummy melatonins. Like, I wouldn't give a kid that. First off, their melatonin levels are so high, they don't, they don't need melatonin. And I... And I would not have any melatonin gummies around your house because I think kids could like take a handful of those. And then, the re, you know, I, I think that could be a negative thing. And that's the only negative thing that I've read about melatonin. It's mainly been with the kids. 
uh, getting these gummies. So, but I, I think it only has positive effects and I really do recommend it for all of my cancer patients. Uh, and I try to get them up to at least 20 milligrams. Some of them can't get to there, but we usually start with the three. Then I tell them, hey, add another three if you can, go up to nine, go up to 12, and just kind of work your way up to 20. So earlier on, I just want to go back. You mentioned about yourself. You were talking about not taking medications to get yourself into remission and using diet predominantly to do that. If we have some cancer patients who are listening does that mean that's going to work for everyone and that they should just do that because they heard it here? Oh, no. I've, I've been taking medication for six years. And one thing I don't do, I never tell patients to go off their conventional therapy. In fact, I've had patients, like I have this one girl that I'm counseling right now. She was diagnosed with breast cancer when she was 29. And I guess she had relatives that maybe went through chemo and it's it can get ugly. That's face it. You lose your hair. You're, not, you're nauseated. You know, sometimes you get ulcers on your in your mouth. So she tried the Gerson therapy. You know, she, they were, she was drinking like 13 juices a day, doing you know six coffee enemas. She did that for about a year, and the cancer just kept getting worse. Then she went to another holistic person. They did methylene blue with ozone and mistletoe IV. Kept getting worse. Then she came to me, and I her name was Samantha. I said, Samantha, you you really need to get on some conventional therapy. I said, when you have when you have billions and even trillions of cancer cells in your body, there's no way that just food is going to kill all those cancer cells. You need to take a holistic approach, use the best of conventional medicine and use the best of food and lifestyle changes. And she's done that. She's doing really, really well. And I have quite a few patients like that. I, in fact, I have one lady right now, she's in stage four ovarian cancer where she, she was screwing around with just these alternative treatments for like three years and now she's stage four ovarian you know, and I'm constantly in contact with her at this point I'm advising things like you know IV vitamin C you know ozone treatments hypothermia treatments so when you get to the end of the end of the road you got to start pulling out all the stops uh, at that point so uh, but um, but I never tell patients in fact I have two patients right now that have multiple myeloma that have been just doing, natural measures like a whole food plant-based diet, different supplements and so forth. And there, and it's amazing that you can keep your numbers pretty stable with that. And it just shows the power of these natural measures. But I have one patient that the numbers are starting to go up. So I said, hey, listen, you need to get on some treatment. I mean, they're, they're going up. You don't want this thing to get out of hand. The other woman actually has kept herself pretty stable. Her numbers are all abnormal, but she's staying stable, stable just with the uh, whole food plant-based diet, different supplements, teas, and so forth. So, But a lot of these patients, I'm actually encouraging them to do conventional therapy. And they're they're fighting me because they had a relative that went through it, and they just have a very negative connotation about chemo. Sure. It's very uncomfortable, and it's very devastating for the family to watch. And yeah, I, really I've is. had a lot of clients, and I work with other health practitioners whose clients are going through both. They're doing conventional, but they're doing everything that they can to support their body. And when they're using my redox protocol, they're still losing their hair because it's chemotherapy. But yeah. They're not getting nauseous and they're not having those ulcers and they're able to eat more and keep their energy up more and be happier and have a little bit more color in their face, which makes it a much more pleasant experience. And, you know, we we definitely go back and forth on, on this show talking about, you know, pharmaceuticals and stuff like that. But we do say, you know, when you're in a life and death situation, it's, it's a much different story, but being able to keep your body working properly and keep your spirits up and feel better is is really important as well. So a com combination of both seems to be working well for most people that that I'm coming in contact with as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I essentially, you know, personally, what I recommend for my patients, I mean, I do like 30 different herbal supplements. I do 16 different freeze-dried powders in my morning coffee. I do five different teas in combination to get synergistic effect. I do 11 different nuts together. So I, I have an approach that works, but once again, it's done with conventional therapy. And one of the things I get in an argument with, with some of these oncologists is they do not want their patients to take any kind of antioxidants while they're getting their treatment. I, I go through some of the studies. Keith Block, I don't know if you're familiar with his study. He looked at 965 different studies, people that were taking antioxidants with their cancer therapy. 
and he found that it had no negative effects on the end results. Uh, patients actually felt better, had less side effects. They were able to hand, they were able to complete their their program. Another study in my book it was 280 different studies of the meta analysis came out to the exact same conclusion. In fact, in that study, they found in general the patients actually did better the results. And and one of the other things I get into these oncologists about because it is a knee jerk reaction, uh, you know, because chemo does work by creating free radical activity. You know, they feel if you take an antioxidant. It's going to neutralize that free radical activity. But there's an IV antioxidant that was approved about 20 years ago. It's called Amiget. And it was developed to prevent damage to the normal tissues when an individual is getting radiation treatments. And when they did the clinical trials, they found that when the people were getting the Amiget, which is a very, very powerful antioxidant, way more powerful than, for instance, green tea, that it had no negative effect on the end result. And it did protect the normal cells, uh, and the cancer cells were destroyed. So I, I really encourage my patients to just take their supplements. In fact, I take my Revlimid, which is the drug that I take. I take it in the evening. I take it with 30 herbal supplements at the same time. I told my oncologist that the first time he almost passed out. But personally, I think there's a lot of advantages to that because one of the first studies I ever read in Nature when I got diagnosed was an article by Mikhail Munchke. He's a world-known genomic uh, researcher. And he stated that by the time you are diagnosed with cancer, you have about 5,000 DNA mutations in that cancer cell. And by the time you relapse, you're at about 12,000. And a lot of those relapses, I personally think, occur from the medications, the chemo and so forth, because they are creating a lot of free radicals and they're damaging the DNA of a lot of normal cells. So what I tell my patients, and one of the reasons I've been able to keep a lot of my patients in remission is I just tell them, listen, your main goal should be to try to limit the number of DNA mutations because the less DNA mutations that are developed, and then on average day, you get about 19,200 hits to your DNA through free radical activity. And our body's able to clean up a lot of that you know, while we're sleeping, when we're deep sleep. But we really want to minimize that. And the best way to do that is really with a whole food plant-based diet. In fact, I'd go through um, uh, some different diagrams of ORAC units with different types of foods. For instance, there's one diagram that has uh, like a Egg McMuffin, a Big Mac, a steak, some parsley compared to like a sweet potato with a teaspoon of cinnamon and a pinch of clove. Well, all day with that standard American diet, there were only 44 ORAC units. So that's the ability of food to be able to neutralize free radicals. That one sweet potato had 26. Then I show another diagram, five you know, typical standard American breakfast. The, the highest one had like 30 ORAC units. One smoothie with a teaspoon of amla, which is Indian gooseberry, that's the most potent antioxidant fruit on the face of the earth. That one smoothie had 1,500 ORAC units. So when you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, you are really neutralizing a lot of that free radical activity that's going to create DNA damage, which is then going to put that patient into a situation where they're going to relapse. So um, so eating whole food plant-based and then a lot of the herbal supplements that I recommend, some people never heard of them before, you know, things like neem, noni fruit, mangosteen. I mean, I kind of go through them all uh, with the patient and um, some of them you know Turmeric is probably the most important one. Uh, turmeric alone has been shown to uh, affect 80 different cancer cell signaling pathways. I mean, it is a very potent anti-cancer um, herb. In fact, with, with MGUS, which is one of the earlier stages of myeloma, it kind of goes MGUS smoldering myeloma, uh, Golenbeck's group in Australia, I mean, they actually showed with eight grams of turmeric per day, they were able to lower the M spike, which is kind of one of the main biomarkers of uh, MGUS by like 33%. So it, it, in fact, my oncologist, I finally got him, he prescribes it to all of his patients now. So <laughs> he saw that it worked for me. So he's, he's doing it for, you know, for other patients too, but, but doing the herbal, you know, supplements helps. Um, there are some vitamins, but obviously vitamin B12. I check everybody's vitamin D level. I try to get that between 80 nanograms uh, to 100 nanograms. I think that's extremely important. Most people, when I check, they're usually like at 29, 30. 
especially when they're living uh, up north. But really, when you do a combination of the conventional with whole food plant-based diet, herbal supplements uh, with a lot of teas, uh, I do a lot of herbs and spices, uh, then it's stress reduction, sleep, we talked about that. And we did talk about exercise because exercise really is the kingpin. Uh, as far as lifestyle changes, because let's face it, when you exercise, we were talking about stress management. How many times have you felt totally stressed out and then you took a run and you felt, geez, what was I stressed out about? Or if you exercise consistently, you seem to sleep a lot better. So exercise is the kingpin. And when you look through the scientific literature, especially with breast cancer, I mean, it's, it's almost like a chemotherapeutic drug. There's one study that I have in my book where they took women that have breast cancer and they had one group, they were walking one mile per day and they lowered their cancer relapse rate by 24%. Second group ran two thirds of a mile. They lowered their cancer relapse rate by 40%. The third group ran 2.3 miles per day. They lowered their cancer relapse rate by, believe it or not, 95%. It's almost and that, unbelievable. And that was controlled? There was nothing else yeah, that they were doing? it was doing. controlled. No, they weren't, didn't change their diet or anything. It was just exercise. Wow. So exercise definitely has a very powerful effect, I think, for all cancers. Um, it, it it does other things. It, it, it really enhances your immune system. It helps your innate antioxidants work better. It actually diminishes your uh, your cancer growth factors. It jacks up your tumor suppressor genes. So it, it does a multitude of things. Um, it actually, that autophagy that we were talking about, the, the ability to clean up misfolded proteins and debris in the body, autophagy actually occurs when you exercise too. So it, it's just something that I personally do every single day. I, I never miss a day of exercise. Uh, even if it's, uh, there was a recent study that came out, and I actually have one in my book that shows that just six minutes of exercise will jack up your natural killer cell activity by 50%. So natural killer cells are the cells that kill your uh, your cancer cells. And so when I have a patient that says, I don't have time, I go, hey, listen, you know, I have this band routine that I send them. I, I, I developed this little band routine. It's like a three-minute video. And it takes me about 15 minutes to get through. It hits every muscle group. And so I, I send the video to everyone. I go, listen, I do 40 reps, just do 20 reps. And that'll be like seven minutes and you can get out the door, you know, and do it in your house. I try to tell people not to go to the gym because when you, when you have to go to the gym, you got to drive there. You're going to run into somebody. It's going to take you. You're going to be in there for half an hour, 45 minutes. You got to sure, it's back. much more, it's like much a more time consuming. So, yeah. So you're going to not do it consistently, you know, so, but exercise really is one of the most important lifestyle changes. And then I, I think the other thing that I didn't put in my book, in fact, I'm writing a second edition, is uh, uh, the microbiome is something that I've really focused my study on because that has really tied the whole thing in together for me. Because, for instance, I've always read articles that people that eat plant-based uh, have better mood, they have better cognition. And then I started reading about the microbiome. The microbiome secretes like 90% of your serotonin and 50% of your dopamine. Well, that kind of explains a lot of that. And also the free fatty, the, the, the short chain fatty acids that the gut bacteria make, they actually cross the blood brain barrier and they make this brain derived neurotropic factor, which allows the neural connections uh, to increase in your brain. And also we've now found that you can actually make about 1500 new brain cells per day through this, um, this neurotropic factor. So, so that's just kind of one incidence. Uh, the other thing that I tell my cancer patients, and this is really fascinating to me because I always heard, you've probably heard that your immune, your intestine, your gut bacteria control like 70% of your immune function. And I never really understood that until I really got into this. And what's fascinating is that you have about 37 trillion gut bacteria in your large colon. You have one lining of cells in the colon. They're called colonocytes. These bacteria send signals through that one layer of colonocytes to your immune cells. And they tell them where to go, how hard to fight, when to back off. Like the immune uh, system's getting out of control, it'll tell the T regulatory cells, hey, you need to tone down that inflammation. So they're kind of like the conductors of the immune system. So when you are eating 
a variety of vegetables. In fact, I don't know if you're familiar with the American Gut Project. Dr. Robert Knight, he's one of the premier microbiome scientists in the world. He spearheaded this project. It's called the American Gut Project. They've already analyzed 15,000 uh, different stole samples uh, in correlation with these very detailed questionnaires. You know, what do you eat? How do you sleep? Exercise and so forth. And what they found was people that eat 30 different or more plant foods, not servings, just plant foods, per week had the most diverse, healthiest microbiome, gut microbiome. People that ate 10 or different plant foods per week had the least healthy, and they had a lot of antibiotic-resistant bacteria, probably because they were eating meat. So the thing that I really encourage my patients to do is try to eat at least 30 different plant foods. And it's really not that hard to do. For instance, my salad, I checked it the other day. I had 25 different plants in there, <laughs> you know? So instead of like putting lettuce and tomato, onions and carrots in there, I have like a couple broccoli, a couple cauliflower, you know, I have some kale, I have some Swiss chard, I have some corn, you know? So you want to put a little bit of everything in there. And if you make a soup, you know, there's about 12 different cookbooks that I send my patients. The Blue Zone Kitchen Book has some great soups. But just in that soup alone, there's like 12 or 13 different plant foods. So right there, you're already up to like, what, 37 plant foods. And you only there's only two foods that you ate that week. And, and it doesn't intimidate people as much when you tell them that. Like when you tell them you've got to eat whole food plant-based immediately, that kind of freaks them out. But if you tell them, hey, try to eat 30 different plant foods per week, they can handle that initially. And then you can kind of work them up to whole food plant-based. So I think that's amazing to have people go out there and start to think about how many different plant foods am I eating in a week? So I challenge everybody listening to the podcast now to count how many different plant foods you're eating in a week. See if you're hitting that 30. We'll probably make a post on Friday that's going to ask you, we're going to, we're going to quote you on that. And then we're going to ask people to put how many plant foods they've eaten in that week down below. There's just so many, so many great pieces of information. And I think what's key for people is whether you are in the situation where you have cancer now or not, all of these things that you're talking about can be incorporated very slowly over time to just have a healthy lifestyle, which is essentially what it's all about. And I know that you're a wealth of information and have so much more. So if people want to find out more about you or watch your videos, where would you like them to go? Or read your book. What's the Or read your book. book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my book is Beat Back Cancer Naturally. They can get it on Amazon. If they get it on my website, which is Natural Insights into cancer.com. I do give them a signed copy. I charge the same as what it's on Amazon. Uh, if they want to schedule a one or two hour virtual consultation, they basically just go on my website, Natural Insights into Cancer. Uh, they hit shop, then they hit virtual meeting, and then they can sign up. We basically communicate through text message uh, to get a good time for them. And then I do a lot of micronutrient testing. I have a, uh, I, through Quest, I do a 70 plus health biomarker analysis. And in that I check you know, all the vitamins, minerals, heavy metals, human growth, uh, insulin growth factor one, which I think is really super important. I try to keep that between 120 and 160. And by the way, vegans have, most of them are within 120, 160. Uh, meat eaters are usually up over 200. And that is a very powerful growth stimulator. So we always try to keep that low. I check their omega-6 to omega-3 ratios, their hemoglobin A1C. I do a metabolic profile, lipid profile. So it's it's pretty intense. Uh, they basically just take the sheet, they scan it, they take it to Quest. Quest sends me the results. I give them recommendations. But I will tell you, I have never had one single patient yet have all of those values normal, and almost everybody has abnormal minerals. It's it's kind of mind blowing. In fact, there was a study in the International um, Journal of Sports Nutrition, and when I read this article, I was kind of befuddled by it. But they looked at four different diets. They looked at the Atkins, the Best Diet, it was the Dash, and then the South Beach Diet. And what they found was was in every one of them, uh, chromium, iodine, and molybdenum were either non detected or very, very low. And then uh, it was uh, biotin was uh, one of the vitamin E and then vitamin D were the three vitamins that were very low. And when I do the testing, it's kind of crazy. That's 
that's kind of what I come up with. I, I don't think I've ever had anybody have a detected molybdenum level yet. It's kind of crazy. Most of them are very low in the chromium. One thing with people that eat whole food, plant-based diet, they really have to be careful with their iodine because they're not eating seafood. You know, either use some iodized salt. I personally put nascent iodine drops. You can get them on Amazon. I put three of those in my drinking water every day, and that that takes care of it. Because when I first started eating whole food, plant-based, I did check my iodine level, and it was low. So mm -hmm. that's one thing that people that eat whole food, plant-based really do need to be aware of. But I do that, and then I do microbiome testing. Uh, basically, the patient signs up for it. The company sends them this kit. It looks like a little, <laughs> looks like a little, my wife, the first time she saw it, it was like a little French fry container, but you put your, excuse me, your poop on there, and then you put it, there's a special way you wrap it, put it in a FedEx, you put it in the refrigerator overnight, and then you send it to the company, and then they send me the results. So it gives me a diversity score, a dysbiosis score of your gut microbiome. So, uh, but that's interesting. So they can do all that on the website too. So they basically hit shop, then they hit nutrient monitoring, and they can get that. So, but that they're really the best ways. And then I have a very prolific uh, Instagram site. It's called Cancer Veggie Doc. Uh, I do two recipes every week. Uh, I do two videos every week. Um, so they might want to check that out. I think it's a great uh, Instagram site. Dr. Brandy, thank you so much for your time. We're going to link to everything you just said in our show notes at planttrainers.com so people can check it out, check out what you're doing and keep track. And if they need your help, they'll contact you. So All thanks right. for being here on the That's Plant great. Trainers podcast. Hey, it's great chat with you guys. Okay, take care. Okay, Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you all so much for listening to this edition of the Plant Trainers Podcast. We want to make sure that you subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or any other podcasting platform. We really appreciate the feedback we receive from you. Every time we get a five-star rating or review on iTunes from one of our fans, it really helps other people find us just like you did. Thanks so much to our patrons. To become a patron, visit us at patreon.com slash plant trainers, even supporting us with $1 really makes a difference in the quality of the show and don't forget to connect with us on instagram and twitter our handle is at plant trainers like plant trainers on facebook join our newsletter and check out our website at planttrainers.com for awesome recipes a list of our services and of course our latest podcast we encourage you to email your questions to info at planttrainers.com so that we can help you improve your quality of life through nutrition and fitness so we hope we've inspired you today join us again next time and, and have have a healthy, healthy day. day. Or is that too corny? It's a little cheesy.